Little update, uh, people were asking me about how our officer is doing. He's doing very well for being shot seven times. Uh, just kind of a little uh, brief of where he got hit for the folks who don't know. Not in any particular order, I'll just start top to bottom. He got hit through the motorcycle helmet and through his ear, so he'll fit in in a Portland crowd with a gauge. Uh, he got hit in the jaw right here, right in the mandible, didn't knock any teeth loose, bullet fragmented in there, stayed in there. He took two in the, in the body armor. He took uh, one through and through the bicep, in and out of the bicep, out through the elbow, through and through the arm, and through and through the upper thigh. And pretty much nothing but net, nothing vital hit, no arterial bleeding. Uh, they did surgery on him that night to take the bullet and the bone fragment out of his jaw and uh, put a little plate in there, and the surgeon came in the next day and said, if you want to go home, you can go home. So, um, so uh, yeah, he did very, very well, I guess, for being shot. I don't know, but uh, bad guy, we uh, took him into custody. Um, he was very close to not going to court, and, uh, but he made the decisions that kept him alive, which was good. Uh, it kind of segues into our discussion today that we did apply the taser to him, um, and uh, that helped a lot, so that worked out well. So he did well. So today, I have to stand behind this podium, which I hate, but we'll just have to, I can't see everybody. Oh, hi, Knessa. How you doing? All right, so we're going to talk about taser use. It's been about three years since we talked about it, and there's been some new medics come through. So we'll talk about the, what the taser is, how it works, probe removal, and uh, if we're fortunate enough, we'll have a live demonstration today. So look amongst yourselves. I'll tell you what, Davin stepped up a couple times already. So he's had his time in the barrel. He needs somebody else to step up there. So we'll think about that. So again, I'm Doug Rickard, Vancouver Police, uh, element leader of the uh, Thames unit. Not operational anymore. I had 10 years of, of carrying all that stuff, and I'm done with that. So let's see here. So this is going to be your response to uh, taser use after you utilize taser, what to do and how to do it. So uh, a lot of people have a kind of perception of what a taser is, and this is what most okay, people think kids, the taser you're is. You're in for a real treat today. These gentlemen have kindly volunteered to demonstrate how a stun gun is used to subdue a suspect. That's right. Wait a what? Now, there's two ways to use a stun gun. Up close and personal. Really <laughs> or, you can shoot it from a distance. Now, do I have any volunteers who want to come up here and do some shooting, huh? All right, how about you, young lady? Come on up here. All right. Let's go, handsome. Come on. Not you, fat Jesus. Slide it on back. You, pretty boy. All right, now it's real simple. All you got to do is point, aim, and shoot. All right? Okay. <laughs> you don't really want to do this. You can do this. Just focus. Don't listen to this, man. Let's think this thing through. Finish him! Go! Oh, yeah! <laughs> right in the nuts! That was beautiful! <laughs> well done. Give her a hand, everybody. We got one more charge left. Anybody want to do some shooting up here? How about you, big man? Come on up here. Okay, same instructions, just point, aim, and shoot. There you go. That's the stuff. I like the intensity. Eye of the tiger. Good. You're holding 50,000 volts, little man. Don't be afraid to ride the light. Stop! Stop! In the face! In the face! No! <laughs> oh! Oh, he's still out! He's still out! <laughs> All right, everybody relax. Take it easy. We've seen it before. He just needs a little extra. There we go. <laughs> Some of these big boys, you got to give them two shots. All right, kids, who wants to get their fingerprints done, huh? Come on, let's go. So we'll talk about those two targeting locations a little bit later. Not necessarily the best.
provide some theory and practical training how to give you folks uh, the necessary knowledge to treat a patient who's been exposed to a taser application. Again, this is not a taser user course, so after this you can't go out and start tasing folks unless you really want to. So there's a warning that comes with it. And may that's in Europe with that uh, picture there. So some of the technology of the taser. 50,000 volts across the arc, over 1,200 volts across the body through the probes. So the voltage is not what really hurts people or kills people, right? It's an amperage. So to put it so I can figure it out, there's your wall socket that I've been electrocuted many times before. And then a Christmas tree bulb and then the taser. Uh, 36 ten thousandths of an amp it puts out. So that's why it makes it relatively safe for folks um, as compared to people getting shocked at home. Apparently there's been f over 500 people volunteering to be electrocuted. Um, they actually did them in uh, labs that check their blood chemistry, stress hormones, breathing, body core temperature, et cetera, et cetera, and the data points were collected. So there's been some scientific studies, not just looking at folks who's had ta taser applications and, and have not survived. Okay, I did something. I know. What should I do? Push this button? How about that one? No. Okay, I want to zero. Roger. Copy that. Okay, so when they, uh, part of the thing is that uh, they had some folks die in custody after taser application. So they took, really took a good look at it and, and did some cardiac testing. So it did not electrically capture the human heart when used for probe deployment. And that's in agreement with a couple of prior studies. Uh, by these officers, but it's not, it's contrary to animal studies where heart capture occurred. So it did start, they did originally uh, do the studies on animals and it did have heart capture, so they went to uh, human studies and it did not do that. Okay, I figured that out. Boom. All right. Okay. The risk of an electronic controlled device application has a negative effect on a person's heart is not zero. It's very, very low, but it is not zero. So just understand that when you get called out to a scene where we um, deploy the taser, do your regular assessment on a patient, uh, and if it's necessary, if they're presenting properly, go ahead and run a 12 lead on, or at least a four lead. So it says one in 100,000 applications. And what they're looking at there is um, folks that have volunteered to care the taser, uh, are encouraged to take an application of the taser. So that's all of us, basically, who carry the taser on duty. Uh, generally, we uh, ride the lightning, at least for a short period of time. So that's where they get that, plus the uh, infield applications of the taser. So one in 100,000, that's an estimate of the current risks. Okay, experts have identified the heart-to-dart distance as being the key determining factor of whether the ACD can affect the heart. So the further the dart, heart away, dart is away from the heart, the lower the uh, affecting heart. What we teach our people now is, is not to try to deploy over where the heart area is, front or back, if possible. To reduce that effect, that 1 in 100,000 effect, to keep the, uh, the risk even lower. But it could still be effective on the, on the person we're applying the taser to, without putting it directly over the cardiac area. But the studies show it's the, the effects are less than struggling, resisting, fighting with the cops, fleeing, or whatever it is. Sometimes it's in combination, because if we're going to have to electrocute somebody, generally what happens is they're doing some of these other things also, which if somebody has a negative outcome after a taser has been applied, it can be... Uh, can be a contributing factor with the struggling, the resistance, any type of um, any type of chemicals that might be on board with those folks. So, so the uh, we have to take that into consideration when you're doing your assessment on your patient. We have not scientifically tested pregnant women, uh, the infirmed or the elderly, uh, small children, low body mass folks. So. If it, it's applied to any of these folks, we need to make sure that we get a good assessment on them. Just for the fact that it may or may not affect them any differently from an average size adult, but because there's no numbers or science behind it, uh, we treat those as a higher risk group.
you may have seen this before. We're called upon to deal with individuals that are uh, physiologically or metabolically compromised. And that's the ones we talk about that might be uh, maybe some uh, mental illness along with some chemicals on board, whether legal or illegal, that want to fight with us. As a result, arrest-related arrest death may occur. Yes, might have some pre-existing conditions that maybe only uh, present themselves after um, they go to the hospital and or uh, a medical exam if uh, it turns out negative. So assess your patient for any metabolic change that may, may occur that we're looking at, uh, elevated uh, heart rate, body core temperature, et cetera. Talked a little bit about this already. 50,000 volts, 12, uh, 1,200 volts across the body. That's what the, the, your patient or the or suspect is receiving. Four thousandths of an amp. If you want to look at it in joules, it's only 36 hundredths of a joule per application. So when we're looking at that compared to our uh, defibrillator devices. A lot more of the injuries that we see with uh, taser application is falls. Um, when uh, taser is properly applied, you kind of lo lock up the muscles of the body and the person may fall. So uh, when we first got this uh, tool, we had people, that were suicidal people on the roof of a house, and they said, just tase him. He'll stop. And uh, so we don't want to shoot people off roofs or bridges or anything like that in order to save them. So part of our training is, is looking at our environment and take that into consideration. So anybody running in from an elevated position, flammable or explosive environment, very low risk of that, but it can occur. It is an electrical device. If it's properly applied and both probes go into the skin, there should be no electrical arc happening anywhere. But especially with our weather here, Especially with our weather here and people wearing heavier coats, the probe deployment may or may not contact the skin. It doesn't necessarily mean that it won't be effective because it can be up to an inch away from the skin and still be effective, but you have that arc that's going to jump from the end of the probe to where the skin is at. It's actually arcing as it's, it's projecting out as it gets close to the skin. So we want to take that into consideration. Uh, obviously pregnant. In water, it's been deployed into water, and there's no electrical shock danger there. But when you lock the guy's muscles up, he can't swim anymore, and those wires aren't strong enough to hold him up. So we have to take that into consideration also of tasing people in and or around water. We saw some sensitive target areas up there in that movie. So that's uh, some risks. And old folks falling down or the infirmed are obviously risk also. So, some people see what the probe looks like. That's what it looks like up close. And a harpoon look. At, it's a number eight fish hook that has, doesn't have the bend in it yet. So it does have a barb on the end. So it'll leave a little mark when they're removed. The wire is a copper or steel wire that's uh, coated, so it's not supposed to be conductive. So when we, when we um, deploy the taser, if the probe is embedded in a sensitive area, and they're listed there, they need to go to the hospital to have it removed. Uh, this includes uh, any uh, deployment into bone. We have shot people in the head with the taser before unintentionally, and uh, they actually had to um, do a little surgery to take the probe out. So face, neck, breast, and groin area, sensitive. That's sensitive. So into the skull, it'll actually penetrate the bone. This is one of the reasons we prefer to shoot uh, or deploy the taser in the back of people, into their back rather than the front. Uh, what it does, it helps remove some of the sensitive areas out of play, number one. Number two, the back, generally the back is more mus has more muscles and less fat on it, where we can get some good uh, pro penetration into muscle, and uh, it affects the, uh, the uh, suspect more. I like to call them patients. Okay. So taser probe removal. This is from your protocols. The Vancouver police will call you out to remove the probes. That's part of our 
standing orders there. Other agencies may have other orders. County will remove them themselves unless it's in a sensitive area. Uh, make sure the cartridge has been removed from the weapon or the wires are cut or, or uh, otherwise broken. Uh, you can put one hand on the patient where the probe is embedded, stabilize the skin surrounding the puncture site. Place your hand firmly on the gripping probe, one quick motion, yank it out. We'll have a movie here in a second uh, to show you how this is done. Check to make sure the entire probe has been removed. What happens is, uh, on occasion, the dart itself has been uh, disengaged from the probe body, so it might leave the dart in the skin, and you'll have to get a uh, pair of pliers or something to yank those things out with. Okay, there are darts that are sharps hazard. Treat them as such. Go ahead and dispose of them in a sharps container. Contraindications. Uh, probes embedded in the face, neck, groin, or female breast should not be removed in the field. Transport for removal. We'll add bone to that. Patients uh, demonstrating any of the following. Uh, excited delirium, acute exhaustive mania. Anybody pre presenting that way, just uh, take, keep a good eye on them. Persistent abnormal vital signs. Abnormal subjective complaints including chest pains. Shortness of breath, nausea, or headaches. The uh, guy that we caught that shot our officer, when we tased him, he went for, uh, I think we downloaded the taser and it was 20 seconds. So he, he uh, we, I think we used our whole battery on him. He, uh, 20 seconds after that, he complained of chest pain, said he had congestive heart failure, and he was, uh, feels like he was going to die today. I said, yes, um, we'll get a paramedic crew out here as soon as we can. So uh, they arrived, engine, I think engine six arrived. Anybody, was anybody here on that? There you go. So uh, we, I told you guys come out here, take the taser darts out, right, and assess him. He's good? Yeah? Okay. So we took care of him. We got him medical aid as soon as possible, and we got them uh, extricated out of this area. Burn hazard. We've tested this with taser, with pepper spray. Um, and it's like most uh, flammables, it has to be the right concentration of air and, and, and um, fuel. But it can ignite. The pepper spray that we use and the county uses does not have that flammable propellant in there to cause it to ignite. And if you're there and we're tasing and, it, and using pepper spray, maybe you shouldn't be there already. But it can ignite. It's something to be aware of. And one thing we've added to this is that if this turned into a death investigation, we may ask you to just leave the probes and wires intact for forensic evidence. There's ways they could examine that using the magic somehow. So if, if you get there and the person is is has not been able to resuscitate, uh, let's go ahead and leave everything intact. You ask the officer to remove the cartridge from the taser itself and leave it in place, and it'll be no endangered for you folks there. So here's a video on the probe removal. For you folks that may not be able to see it up close when we do it live. Okay, maybe not. Uh, previous. Previous. desktop.
not going to work. There you go. Go the same way. It worked last time. Desktop. Uh, taser probe removal. One more down. There you go. Stabilize them. Obviously, he'd be in handcuffs at this point. Just break the wires. It's best if you can do this fairly soon after the uh, the taser, because right now he's a little numb there. He won't feel a thing. You wait long enough, he's going to get some feeling back, and you're going to feel a little tug. Just supporting him. Don't get this support hand too close. Again, you don't want to rake it with that probe. I've seen guys pull out and actually push it back and poke themselves. Just no need to stabilize it that close. It's right here. You're not trying to stretch the skin or anything like that. Using your thumb and forefinger, grab it right down by the base. Get a good, firm grip on it. Just yank straight up like that. You can secure this. There's a couple ways you can do it. You can just drop it right back down into this little the hole it came out of. This one way, put that there. This one, same thing. Close grip, straight out. Make sure the, the barb is attached to that thing. Everything's intact, good. Just drop it in there. Now you can secure this simply by holding it like such. Pull your glove back over it. I'll demonstrate that as soon as we're done checking on him. Okay, be a little bit of blade. I'm gonna pull your shirt up. Get the impact sites. Okay, the one right here. One right here, no bleeding at all. We're gonna go ahead and give a little alcohol wipe. Oh, thank you. Just to be sure. Bandage. Okay, so a little bit of a summary. We'll call for EMS to respond on any taser, uh, taser probe deployment. The other agencies may or may not per their policy, so be aware. Uh, you're going to remove the probes, assess the patient if requested or needed, and transport to the emergency department if there's embedded in a sensitive area or in bone. Um, in the past, CAMAS has had what's called an X-REP. It's a taser that's shot out of the shotgun. Has anybody seen that? Yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive, but it didn't perform as advertised a lot of times because uh, there's some contributing factors. And from what I understand, CAMAS is no longer deploying that uh, weapon system. There's other tasers out there that actually have, I think, three loads in them. Is that correct? Three loads. So we could take out the whole group, I guess. I don't know. But we can actually deploy the taser three times. So if we, sh if we deploy it once and it doesn't take effect, we can... Without reloading, we can immediately deploy a second charge uh, at, the, at the suspect. So here's some of your protocols here. It's a non-lethal neuromuscular interruption weapon deployed by law enforcement officers designed to create temporary motor skill dysfunction to a violent combative subject. It works by firing two wire attached darts that can strike a suspect up to 15 feet or more. Our, uh, our probes are actually 21 feet in length. We, we say that 15 feet is optimal before the probe spread as well as, um, as, well as targeting. It delivers 50,000 volts of electricity but is not harmful to vital body functions such as heart rhythm, pacemaker function, or respirations. However, it should instantaneously incapacitate the person. 
We found that the taser is about, what, 78% or so effective? Okay, so it's, it's not 100% with everybody. You have, again, tr contributing factors with clothing, loose clothing, not just heavy clothing, but loose clothing, uh, peripheral hits. We prefer, we, the, the further the darts spread, the more muscles we can affect. Uh, the guy we deployed on the other day, he, we were aiming towards his chest, and he turned, so we got one in his elbow and one in his shoulder. It eventually took effect through pain, not necessarily neuromuscular interruption, because it only affected the muscles between the probes themselves. When we press the trigger on the taser, it will automatically uh, cycle for five seconds. If we hold it down, it'll go as long as we hold the trigger down. If we need to do it for less, then we could turn the machine off, but it's set for five seconds. Taser dart removal, well, that didn't work out too well. So we're, this is we talked about this, make sure the cartridge is removed from the weapon or the wire is cut. Place one hand around the skin like you saw there. And here's the key is that when you grab that thing, do it with some conviction. Grab it and just pull it. If you, if you are, have a little trepidation, you pull out, they'll tint that skin, and you'll put it back down and stab them again, and pull it up and stab them again. And that's, that's not giving them any electricity, it's just stabbing them some more. And it'll actually cause them to bleed, because now you're going to start affecting some other areas that haven't been cauterized by electricity. So grab a hold of it, give it a good yank, and it'll come right out. Make sure the entire probe's been removed. They're sharps hazards. Talked about the burn hazard already. Again, look at your patient. Assess them as you would any other patient. If they have any issues, make a recommendation to law enforcement that they get transported to the hospital for uh, further evaluation. Any questions about tasers? Probe removal. That's fairly quick. Yes? Patient refusal? Doc? So the question was, do we need to get a patient refusal on a patient after the, uh, the uh, pros have been removed? So Dr. Whitmer says that, uh, yeah, you don't need to get a medical refusal form unless your assessment indicates that uh, the patient needs to go to the hospital for any underlying medical and or uh, psychiatric condition uh, that you recommend to the law enforcement officers. Other questions? You guys want to get to the show, don't you? Let me ask you, you got hit with a taser today, right? Yes, I did. What happened? Man, I didn't know what happened. I got hit with that. I got blank, short of breath. What did it feel like? You were running, right? Uh-huh. So what do you remember? You're running? I remember I was running. I jumped this gate. After I jumped that gate, I just dropped. That was it. That was it? That was it. What, I just what, dropped. You see anything? Hear anything? Man, I saw the little stars like I told you, you know. I, and then I fell flat on my face, dirt all in my mind. You don't want to deal with that taser, trust me. It's a nasty if, ride, huh? If you, if, you, if you were to get your ass whooped by the police officer, take that ass whooped. Don't take that taser, man. I'm telling you. This client's not been reimbursed for his uh, taser recommendation. A one spot. So, we are prepared to do a live demonstration on taser probe removal. But I do need uh, three volunteers, one to accept the probes and two to assist. So I'll ask for the assistance first. Really? 
Okay, I have two assistants. I need somebody to accept, accept the probes now. Okay. So, if you do me a favor, go see Officer Jedry in the back there. Officer Blaze Jedry, the Vancouver Police, is here to, uh, to assist. He'll get that. And he's going to get the proper uh, liability waivers filled out just in case something bad happens. Now, folks, the question came up. Question came up. Uh, two questions came up. One about, since our officer got shot, about body armor. How do you want us to remove the body armor? We're wearing body armor two different ways now. Um, with underneath the shirts, like we normally had it, the body armor is just held on with the elastic straps around the waist and up over the shoulders. Uh, go ahead and cut the uniform off. If there's bullet holes in the uniform, please try not to cut where any damage to the uniform has occurred, whether it's tearing from uh, a fight, bullet holes, whatever it is. Try to cut around it, but do what you have to do, number one. Number two, the body armor. It's, it's pretty thick. You're not going to cut through it, but cut the straps or remove the straps, the, the, uh, the belly straps or the chest straps and the shoulder straps. And then it's a two-piece panel. They'll come right off. With any penetrating wound, of course, check for your exit wounds front and back. If you get one entrance and no exit, that's, that's okay. That happens. That can happen. Our body armor is rated to stop handgun rounds only. So if, you susp if somebody gets shot and there's a rifle round involved, chances are it will penetrate that body armor. So treat it as such. External carriers that we're wearing on the outside now, generally they're attached up at the top with, with snaps. You can snap those, and it's usually just Velcro around the waist also. Or it might be buckles. So you can cut the straps there, or unbuckle it, and snap the top, and they'll, they'll come off like a clamshell. And uh, all the stuff, if the, a lot of the officers will carry everything on their, on their chest, except for their, their handgun and maybe something else. Go ahead and set that aside. That's going to be part of evidence for the scene. Another question come up about the, the, the gun belt. The gun belt's put on just with a regular buckle. Some of them are harder to figure out than others because they have a, a button in the front to push and squeeze on here. If you have to, you can cut it off. It's not a big deal. But push the button in the front, pinch the two sides, and they'll come off a little bit better. So I'll push the button on the top, pinch the two sides, and they'll come apart. And you take that off. Just leave it entire intact like that, hand it over to the officers. It's going to be part of the crime scene uh, also. Any questions on the law enforcement side? Questions also came up now that with uh, open carry folks and people carrying concealed, what happens if you have a patient that has a weapon on them? What are you to do with it? Um, call law enforcement to the scene to take possession of that weapon for safekeeping at a minimum. Number two, if they have it in a holster in their pants or on their belt, remove it. The holster intact if you can. You take the belt off, whatever it is, and leave the gun in the holster. That's the safest way that you can um, hand it over to us. Don't try to remove it because some of these holsters, well, our duty holsters, they have sometimes one or two or three buttons. And you know, don't even try to think about unloading it to be safe. That's when uh, negligent discharges occur. If it's not in a holster and it's just like this, that's okay too. You handle it with, by the handle. We don't want to touch the go button here. All right, the gun's designed for you to, your finger to go on there, but just hold it by the handle, secure it somewhere in your rig, um, and then hand it over to the police, and they'll take care of it from there. Any questions on the guns? Now, if it's a blue one like this, you don't have to worry about it. It's just a piece of rubber. So it's all good, but on real guns. Any questions? All right. Are we ready to go, Blaze? Where you at? The guy run away? Son of a gun. He ran. Okay, why don't we take a quick... Hey. Oh, he's ready? Maybe he's making a stop prior to. I'm not sure. Quick break. Okay. Um, so unless you knock yourself unconscious on the way down to the ground, as soon as the taser is over, if you choose to continue moving, then you do. Most people choose not to. So that's their choice. Okay? So we need, you've got glasses, we need glasses for you. All right, come on up.
training that you folks want to gather around to see which one of the rules you put together? Sure, Adam over here. Okay. Facing that way. Okay. Here's the thing. Please, no cell phone videos. Uh uh. Okay. And I'm a stickler for this. Unless you want to be the one on the video getting tased, then have at it. Otherwise, no videos. Okay. It's already getting recorded for training purposes because the last thing most of the people want who are volunteering for this is to have that video going up on YouTube. I'm sure everybody now understands why. Okay. So please, no videos aside from the actual training one. Good? Yeah, if you want it recorded, then, then that is fine. Lasers. All right. Where's my, did you put it back in here? Okay. Would you put on periglossal fish? Ah, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> It's just five seconds. Okay, so here's what I want. Okay. I want wrist and armpit, just like this, or even this. That's fine. Okay, you good with that? So go ahead and grab onto them. Um, could we, well, I don't think it'll reach that far, but it would not hurt my feelings if you moved over that way. Yeah, that's fine. What angle do you want? It doesn't matter, man. Anywhere you can get it. If you want to get a good angle on the camera, uh, get, get right about here. Now you can hear everything. Okay. He will probably bring his arms in a little bit. That's fine. Okay. All I care about is that you not hurt his shoulders, and then you just lay him down on the ground. Good. So, yes, it's got a little red dot on it. There you go. Okay. I need one person, one more volunteer. Okay, we good? Taser, taser. <laughs> Nicely done. How was that? <laughs> Nicely done. Don't move. Okay. So, then the question is, if you wanted to, could you get up right now? Yeah. Yeah, I can. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, go ahead and kneel down. <laughs> now, the thing when you're taking out these probes, okay, and to emphasize this, because you guys are the ones who are doing it, not us, okay, because of the shape of the probe, you want to make sure that the supporting hand is not going to get raked by that little prong, right? So, yep. Good. Good firm pressure, straight out. Pull it, hunt. Ready? Go. Stop Nicely resisting. <laughs> and then that's a sharp, right? Correct. Nice. Nicely done. A little bit of blood there. Right, you might so need to get into it. Can't move his legs. <laughs> uh, 
All right. So do me a favor. Go ahead and pull these probes off. Put them in the sharps container. Okay. Right, nothing major. Yeah, and then it just breaks the wire right here. There you go. Good times. Twenty one feet. Mm -hmm. So the, the civilian model works in a couple of different ways. Right, the cartridge is designed to be about fifteen feet. Okay. It is also designed to go for 30 seconds, right? The principle being you tase somebody, you drop it, you go the opposite direction. So it should give you a 30 second head start. That's the selling point behind it. No, it, if you shoot them with more than one, it's still 50,000 volts or 36 thousandths of an amp each time. It doesn't multiply out because it's in parallel, not in series. Any other questions? All right, thanks. You guys are the best audience I've had all day. <laughs> did, did, that, did that hurt pulling the probe out? Steve, did that hurt pulling the probe out? Oh, yeah, actually, tape is the worst thing. It's, uh, I have some experience with that recently. So <laughs> they said it didn't hurt at all taking the chest tube out. It was taking the tape off a week later. <laughs> okay, um, let's take a break for about uh, ten minutes, and then we'll continue. We haven't had sound issues since I told everybody to shut off their Wi-Fi. Oh, interesting. You notice that? It was probably too much bleed. There's 
sucking up all the bandwidth. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's come back to the scene here and uh, get going. Let's grab our seats. I think we have sound now, so uh, we'll just keep. Okay, I'm going to go over uh, a synopsis of some of the protocol changes. You know, we we have made a deal with the, with you that we don't do protocol changes officially, except uh, no more than twice a year, um, and uh, we'll make. Um, and I just bring uh, the, the protocols have already been revised. They're they're out there now, and then I'm just will tell you the uh, the specific things that are changing. Also, I'm going to talk a little bit about sepsis and uh, SERS syndrome, um, and a little bit about hemorrhage control. We'll have some ALP stuff, and we've got some case reviews. So I think I'll start with. Uh, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or SIRS. Uh, it's a nonspecific inflammatory syndrome caused by a number of things. Could be ischemia, inflammation, trauma, infection, or, the, or several things in a combined system. It's a clinical response to a nonspecific insult of either infectious or non-infectious origin. Sepsis is a systemic response to infection. It's further, we can define it as the presence of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, with either a proven or presumed infection. So we use SIRS, the, what, what we're going to further define as signs and symptoms of the systemic inflammatory response system if you suspect that the patient has any of these, uh, if you suspect they have an infection that's causing the systemic inflammatory response, that by definition we'll call that sepsis. And we're going to go into, uh, we're going to have you start calling sepsis alerts when you bring a patient in. We'll further define that. I mean, it's, it's not something that we're going to spank you for if you don't. But I'll tell you why we want you to call a sepsis alert. It's a little bit like calling a STEMI. It, it, it mobilizes the crew. Severe sepsis is SIRS and a presumed infection associated with end organ dysfunction. Hypoperfusion and shock and severe septic shock is sepsis plus hypotension that doesn't respond to fluid bolus. So if you have to go to fluid bo multiple fluid boluses, if you've gone to 1,000, 2,000 cc's of fluid, the patient's still hypotensive, and you have to go to dopamine or norepinephrine, that is defined as septic shock. Sepsis-induced hypotension is a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or a reduction of more than 40 millimeters mercury from the baseline. So if the patient had a baseline of 160 and was now 120, that would be hypotension for that person. Patients meet the criteria for septic shock if they have hypotension hypotension, persistent, and perfusion abnormalities, signs and symptoms of shock, despite adequate fluid resuscitation. This is a pretty picture that shows that the SERS syndrome, which is, can be caused by trauma, burns, pancreatitis, uh, other causes of severe inflammation, sort of merges with bacterial-induced SIRS, which is really the sepsis then. 
Now, what do we want to talk? Why do we want to talk about sepsis in the first place? Why do we worry about it? Well, it's increasing. The incidence of sepsis increases. It's a very big issue nationally as well as here, and I'll tell you about that in a bit. Uh, why is it increasing? Well, there's an aging population. You've got to die of something, right? Uh, Drug-resistant organisms. We've got lots of MRSA out there. We've got other uh, drug-resistant organisms, uh, both gram-positive and gram-negative, uh, that we've sort of caused by overfeeding uh, uh, with overfeeding ourselves with antibiotics and overfeeding animals with antibiotics. We have lots of weakened immune systems because we're li living longer, because we're able to treat things like HIV now, cancer, tran they have transplants. We have multiple patients who have uh, immunosuppression. People who have leukemia have an immunosuppression. The commonest infections that are associated with sepsis, so SIRS with presumed infection, commonest infections are pneumonia, number one. It's gram-positive pneumonia, strep pneumonia, pneumococcal pneumonia, same difference. Intra-abdominal infections, uh, patients get sepsis from uh, things like diverticulitis, they get uh, from ruptured appendix, from anything that's intra-abdominal. Urinary tract and kidney infections, we see a lot of that, particularly in the nursing home population. And bacteremias of other uh, very aggressive bacteria, meningococcus, which we don't see much in this county anymore, staph, and, and other streps, not the pneumococcal strep, but just standard strep. Uh, remember, one of the old, we, years and years ago, we had uh, a lot of talk about the septic shock uh, fr from tampons. That was, uh, that was basically a strep. Get that. Okay. Uh, risk factors for sepsis are extremes of age, compromised immune systems, patients who are already sick, have an, have a, a, an illness already going on, wounds and other injuries, burns, open fractures, invasive devices, catheters, IV catheters, uh, central catheters, very, very high association with sepsis. Uh, so people who are on um, um, multiple doses of medication for their cancer treatment or for an infection and have a, uh, have a uh, uh, indwelling central line for that. Uh, ET tubes, so prolonged ET tube use associated with sepsis local infection, and injection sites, uh, drug users, um, oral and dental uh, procedures, uh, high incidence of sepsis because of the, and uh, also invasive devices, almost anybody who's got a, um, who has a, a metal implant of any sort, hips, knees, anything that's high risk for, higher risk, you know, it's foreign body. So it's high risk for developing infection and getting sepsis. Signs of severe sepsis. And think about it when you go to, I mean, when you go to, particularly to a nursing home or something, you know, significant decrease in urine output or ask, ask the mother of a, a small child who's quite ill, you know, when did they last? How much have they urinated today? How many wet diapers have you had? That's how we establish urine output. Abrupt change in mental status. How many times have we gone out to a nursing home and they said, well, you know, they were really okay yesterday or the day before they were doing their normal, but they haven't been themselves for the last 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so change in mental status. Respiratory difficulty, failure probably pneumonia-related changes with COPD and pneumonia, myocardial failure, so hypotension, uh, a pulmonary edema, abdominal pain, intra-abdominal uh, problems causing sepsis or, and or pancreatitis, 
And decreased platelets causes bru bruising, easy bleeding. Those are all signs of sepsis. One of the issues of sepsis is you, uh, you consume your clotting factor. Now, SIRS itself is defined as two or more of the following variables. You can have all these variables, but only need two of them to have a d definition of systemic inflammatory response. A fever of more than 38 degrees centigrade, which is 100.4, or less than 36. A lot of times we go to nursing homes and find the little old lady who smells like a urinary tract infection and is not normally mentally, not at their normal mental status and unresponsive, and they are cool. They don't have a fever. So anything less than 96.8 is also a sign, a, a positive sign of SIRS. Heart rate of more than 90 per minute, respiratory rate of more than 20 per minute, or a carbon dioxide tension of less than 32, meaning they're hypo, hyperventilating. And of course, white blood cell derangements, we don't test for those. We still green. Which one is the microphone button? Well, that didn't work. Okay, now it's green. Okay. <laughs> We're not yet testing for white blood cell derangement, so. So, treatment of presumed of SIRS syndrome and presumed sepsis. You presume it because you have one of those things plus you think there's an infection. Maintain O2 sats above 95. Let the hospital know. Just call in, say, tell them what you're bringing in. Say, I, we believe this is a sepsis alert. You're not going to be spanked for anything. What that'll do is mobilize our team. Sepsis alert means you think there's an infection and you have either an elevated or a low temperature, a respiratory rate greater than 20, heart rate greater than 90, and the ETCO2 of less than, well, we're going to say 25 because it, it's really the arterial CO2 that we want to test. But if you've got a, if they're really hyperventilating, you'll get an answer. Start at least one IV, administer 250 cc boluses until the blood pressure is at 90. Give them in rapid succession. Checking, of course, in old people for, for uh, pulmonary edema, signs of pulmonary edema, rales and ronchi. If the systolic blood pressure remains less than 90, you think you have a septic patient and you've given 1,000 cc's, start a dopamine infusion at 10 mics, trying to maintain the blood, systolic blood pressure at 90. It's a rapidly progressing, life-threatening condition, usually ends in multi-organ failure. If we don't recognize it early and treat it aggressively, and treating it aggressively is to start antibiotics quickly in the emergency department, and you have to identify it in the emergency department. So the more warning we can give to the ED, the better. They'll get on it just like they won't let grandma lay there uh, for 30 minutes before someone goes in to see her when you arrive, if you say sepsis alert. Anytime you say an alert of any sort, they're going to react to that. So to provide pre-arrival notification that they, we want this patient looked at quickly. Now, around the country, this is getting to, there, there's, there's a, there was a move, uh, there was a little bit of a move earlier this year um, through the uh, National Association of EMS Physician 
directors that, particularly on the East Coast, they were sus they were trying to come up with ways that the that the paramedic could really make the diagnosis of sepsis on the way in, and they were suggesting that they start antibiotics in the rig. Now that's very expensive to carry. Number one, and number two, you've got to. You, it's nice to be right, and there are some side effects of medications. Some people are allergic and they have reactions themselves. So um, uh, that didn't seem to be a really good idea. And the bottom line is that the problem is they would that many many ambulances were uh, disgorging their patients and having having to wait up to four hours before someone could come, a nurse would come to sign out the patient so they could leave. I said, well, this is a simple problem. You could do a, se you do a sepsis alert, tell the, you know, just, you don't, when you do a STEMI, they generally meet you right at the door. So do a sepsis alert, be the same thing, and then they can sign out and, the, and you can leave. The, the real question was getting the, getting the, the, the response of the ED appropriately. So we'll be getting, both EDs will be aware that we'll be calling sepsis alerts now. If you don't call it, you know, it's not like an evil, I, I, it's just a nice thing for the patient. And it doesn't, doesn't cost us anything. Okay. We'll bring this up again. This was sort of sepsis SERS primer. And we'll go, uh, we'll have more later on in the year, especially as we get more into uh, respiratory infections again. Uh, hemorrhage control. Um, okay. Example of a couple of commercially available tactical tourniquets. The CAT tourniquet, the SOF tactical tourniquet. Um, external hemorrhage is getting to be increasingly popular, uh, probably due to um, um, some sort of mass trauma kind of issues. Got a lot of experience with um, extremity hemorrhage as a major cause of uh, death or preventable death. A um, lot of experience from the military, from the Middle East, a Boston uh, Marathon bombings, uh, and also results from National Trauma Data Bank. Uh, looking at the literature on external hemorrhage control, um, uh, a national p expert panel looked at it and did find that use of tourniquets were effective for control of arterial extremity hemorrhage. If direct pressure was ineffective or impractical, and impractical might be that you don't have enough hands to hold direct pressure. You're busy. So that's why the military, you know, everybody carries their own tourniquets. If you've got one arm, you can probably tourniquet yourself with those things. Uh, or you can do your friend quickly. Tourniquet selection has to be based on effectiveness for arterial occlusion. It's not the venous side that we want to occlude, it's the arterial side. Indeed, if you only impede the venous return. <laughs> let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it for technology. Um, if you only impede venous return without adequate arterial occlusion, hemorrhage is worsened. So, we recommend only using commercial devices unless they're not available. So, an improvised tourniquet should never be used. So, we have for a couple of years recommended that if, that if the, the uh, rig, if a, if a agency wanted to carry tourniquets, they carry the commercially available uh, cat-type tourniquet. And once you put it on, don't release it 
until you get to definitive care, i.e., the surgeon, the trauma team. Hmm? No. <laughs> no, not unless you leave it on for days and days and days. Um, so, I don't care what brand you carry as long as it's a commercially available. Now, I have looked over in the last 35 years in this county, I have never seen an extremity injury. I have never personally seen an extremity injury that we could not control with external pressure or with um, or with a uh, pneumatic tourniquet, i.e. a blood pressure cuff blown up above arterial pressure. Now, most of the other, the, other, the other one, the one that we couldn't control, which was the, if you may remember, the guy that cut his axilla with a, with a chainsaw, which is kind of a, an amazing kind of a contortion to do that anyway. You could bring him over to play that game where you go and stretch into odd positions. Um, you couldn't put a tourniquet on that. You need to have an extremity to put the tourniquet on. Um, someone also raised the question recently about stopping external hemorrhage with the, uh, with the combat gauze, the gauze that's soaked with various and sundry uh, clotting devices. That actually, uh, for the money, it's probably not worth it. People, you can control hemorrhage with uh, just normal application of gauze, even gauze in the wound, and then correct pressure just as well as with the trauma pack. Now, the only, the only thing the trauma pack works well for, the trauma gauze, it works well in cases where, you, where you're not very experienced at putting on pressure dressing. And in those cases, it's probably worthwhile to have it. So if someone wants to carry that, North Country asked me if they wanted, if they could carry it. I don't have any objection to carrying the trauma gauze. You don't need a special permit for that. Um, where Use that kind of trauma pack. It's fine. But the best thing would be to learn how to put on really good pressure dressing. Okay. Other changes in our... Orders, Neuro, uh, excited delirium, neurochemical disorder related often to the ingestion of stimulants, um, particularly amphetamines, et cetera, uh, PCP. Bizarre, be bizarre behavior, hyperaggressive, impervious to pain, very combative, tachycardic, tachypneic, hyperthermic, profuse sweating, excessive strength and agitation, noncompliant with requests. The kind of, and then they suddenly, they often will die uh, of apparently cardiac um, issues. Um, excited delirium subjects are difficult con to control. They're paranoid with inappropriate violence, lots really strong. Law enforcement protocol in this county is to control the patient as quickly as possible and give them to staged EMS personnel. It's a medical emergency. It requires immediate intervention and transport to definitive care. Now, we have changed the chemical restraint procedure slightly for excited delirium. Your normal chemical restraint procedure is to consider and treat medical causes of com combative, such as hypoxia, head injury, etc. If the cause is unknown and the patient is thought to be just a psychiatric patient who's agitated, then we use an apsine, 2.5 IV or 5 milligrams IM, and may repeat to a maximum of 10 milligrams IM, 5 milligram IV. Now, the alternative is Geodon because uh, we've been running out of an apsine. It's not been available. And with Geodon, 10 milligrams IM. It's only given IM, not IV. To keep aware of that thing. Yeah. Right. 
If the patient develops um, extrapyramidal symptoms, treat with Benadryl as usual. If you think the cause of the agitation is drug ingestion, we would have you start with Versed for this. Two and a half to five milligrams IV or five milligrams IM. Remember, anapsine, geodon, and Versed can be given IM, and that's good in an agitated patient because you probably not going to be able to start an IV. You can repeat the Versed to a max of 10 milligrams. Now, if, the, if you've gone to full dose of one drug and the other, and the patient is still agitated, then you switch over and you go to the full dose of the next drug, of the alternate drug. Now, don't give both Versed, or don't give both Geodon and Anapsine. It's either or. I'm assuming you won't have the one. You won't have both. Now, if you think the patient is excited delirium, start out with the big hit right off the bat. Five to ten milligrams IM. So if it's a big guy, very agitated, you give him a full ten milligrams IM, and give the full dose of an apsine, five to ten milligrams IM. If you don't have an apsine, give 20 milligrams of geodon. That I will, if you have 10 milligrams of IM Versed and 20 milligrams of geodon on a patient, you will probably have a fairly quiet patient by the time he gets to the ED. Don't use geodon and apsine concurrently, either or. Patient must be EKG monitored, but you're going to do that anyway. Remember, the, especially when you're going to use an apsine or geodon, both of them will, have, will cause prolonged QT. Can't, they're implicated in prolonging QT. These patients go into VTAC, VFib kind of arrest sometimes anyway. So you want to monitor them for that. All right. A little change to clear up the issues on C-spine. Now, this is now also now in your orders. We've gone through a whole thing reiterating our well-established, long-term um, C-spine clearance protocol. It works, and, but you have to be able to, you have to follow it. There's now going to be a caveat at the bottom of the thing, and this is the exact caveat. All patients who you have entered into the trauma system, whether it's a trauma alert or a trauma team, if it's due to blunt trauma, they will at a minimum have a cervical collar on. Now, we've got a couple of cases that uh, that we want to review uh, uh, today that, that will emphasize this further. What I'm saying is uh, about you do not have to immobilize them to a long backboard if it's impractical and they've been otherwise cleared. But if you're putting a patient into the trauma system due to blunt trauma, you should have a reason that they don't at least have cervical spine precautions. Now, all the cervical collar does is tell them to, is to keep them from flopping around a lot. If you can't put them in a long, long backboard because it's impractical, if it's, if it, or because when you put them on a long backboard they start breathing funny, or like the guy we talked about last time who he actually had a fracture of the cervical spine and it was kind of cocked off to one side and he stopped, he would have problems breathing and you had to secure him on his side with blocks and stuff around the neck. He had cervical spine control, but he couldn't go on a backboard flat and he couldn't go, in a, you know, otherwise he probably would have died because as soon as they got him on his back and got him pain relief and he, stuck, he had enough breathing problems that they had to do a crike. 
So you can immobilize a person to the gurney. If you can't lay them flat because of their breathing problems, put them in the position, the position that helps. Not everybody needs to be in a, on a backboard, but they do need to have at least cervical spine precautions because if you're in here for blunt trauma, there's a reason. What's the reason? Well, they fell. They're an old person with a fall. They, they, there's intrusion into the vehicle, and you think it was a terrible accident, and they're, they're really looking okay, but you're going to, but you want to take, but uh, you still need to take the precautions. So, blunt trauma. Now, penetrating trauma is a different animal. Unless you have neurologic signs, you probably don't want to do the full immobilization. And, you know, if they have a, a, a neck injury or chest injury, you want to be able to see what's going on. Okay, other minor protocol changes. Eye gel is officially into your orders. You've already been doing it. Zofran, we increase the dose to 8 milligrams so that it works. I know I got my Zofran when I was, when I was in the hospital for my, because you know, narcotics just do bad things to me. And I got 8 milligrams right off the bat, and I was puking my brains out about 20 minutes later. I mean, stuff, you know, I don't know if it works at all. I wanted to go to Fenergan. <laughs> okay, Alps. And we're going to talk about Alps in just a minute. Recurring, recurring VFib means more than once. Now, Alps criteria. Non-traumatic, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Vascular access, you have to have an IV or an IO. Persistent or recurring VFib VTAC after two or more shocks. You need a minimum of two shocks before you think of Alps. Then, you don't use any open-label amiodarone or lidocaine. No hypersensitive known. Nobody, no, you won't know that because they're not talking to you. Protected populations, we, all, all the usual things, and no study bracelets. There are no, no, I've never seen a no study bracelet for the Alps out there yet. Everybody wants to be resuscitated. What counts as a shock? Rock, EMS agency shock, first responder BLS, AED shock, police, AED shock. Nope. Let's, let's think about that. That's what we're going on there. Because how, could you, how do you know it's recurrent? That's not the way the protocol is written. When you see VFib, you're supposed to shock again, right? By definition, to get recurrent, you have to have given two shocks. We have to make that clear because that was confusing. It's not, it, it was a confusion for other persons as well. So, ALS delivered a shock, non agency delivered a shock. Anybody gives a shock with an AED or you give the shock. So, that counts as the first shock. Then, if you give another shock, that's the second shock. They could do two shocks. Sometimes the AED tells them to shock twice. No ICD shocks. We don't count those because we can't, we don't have any record of that. So what is persistent or recurring VFib? Confirm VFib, pulses VTAC. So pulses needs CPR. Any time after the first shock is really after the second shock. Because you come there and you okay. The patient, the, you come there, and you are, you're the first people on scene. You start doing CPR. You do two minutes of CPR. You look at it. It's V-fib. You give a shock. You start doing CPR again. In that, in that 
So you know only you've got VFEB and you've shocked it once. You don't know what is the result. You're not peaking. So you're doing, you're doing the uh, CPR, you're starting your IO or IV. Um, you maybe are giving a dose of epinephrine. That could be a thought. At the end of two minutes, you, do, you look again. You see V-fib. What's your answer when you first see V-fib? You shock it. That way you know it's a persistent V-fib. Then the next thing you can do is either the epinephrine and the ALPS both together. You could do the ALPS early if you say, God damn, what we really wants this in quick. Give it right after that second shot. I don't care. As long as you have recurrent V-fib. Who okay. cares? We don't care. We don't care. That's okay. You can still give the drugs at that point because you're going to do, you won't know you've got normal sinus rhythm. You know, we got no peaky. You're going to do normal sinus rhythm all the, all the way. You're going to do CPR for two minutes unless the patient reaches up and grabs you. That's a good hint that you can stop. So, if you think, and, and that's exactly the way that our previous, our previous protocol went too, because you didn't start to think anti-dysrhythmic drug until after you'd given at least the dose of epinephrine and after you'd given you know, at least two shocks. So if you think anti-dysrhythmic, now we use ALPS. That's only 17% of the codes, roughly. Study drugs need to be given as soon as possible, which is why I say that, you, you know, give it as soon as possible after the second shock. Now, that second shock may, may occur way down the line. You may come, you may be at the scene and the patient responds. You get ROSC, or at least you get a rhythm. It may not even be a perfusing rhythm. It may be a, you know, it may be a bradycardia. It may be asystole, and you're doing CPR again. Then all of a sudden it comes back. We see that all the time. It comes back to V-fib. That then is persist. That's recurring V-fib. You shock that the minute you see V-fib, and at that point, because you've didn't done two shocks at least, at that point you can get to go to the Alps. You can give it immediately following epinephrine, flush the tube first. Now, and indeed, regulatory agencies do monitor this very care carefully. We, you know, we, we, get, we hear about it every time there's an error. So if VFib, VTAC returns, do the full ALPS procedure. Start in at that dose. What is the full ALPS procedure? First procedure is ALPS 1A, 1B, two syringes. If you gave 1A and 1B and you got pulses back, and then if it happens again, the v tac V-fib recurs, you shock it the minute you see it, and you can give the second dose, syringe two. You treat V-fib, V-tac any time it recurs after one or more, pr more prior shocks. And the reason we say two shocks, remember, is that the minute you identify V-fib, V-tac, pulse of V-tac, you shock it. That's what your whole analysis is. You analyze, you shock, and then you give the drug. Anytime V-fib pulses VTAC recurs after one or more prior shocks, give the ALPS. The first dose is two syringes, unless it's a teeny tiny person. The second dose is syringe two. You wouldn't give syringe two, the second dose, until you know you have persisting VTAC. So if they converted and they have an ROSC, 
after the first dose. You don't need to give the second dose. If, however, after two minutes of CPR, you, let's say you've given ALPS 1A and 1B, after two minutes of CPR, you look and you see V-fib still, you shock it and give syringe number two, the second dose. What if V-fib persists after you give all the study drug? You can go to magnesium and lots of shocks. And you can give more epinephrine and continue CPR and shocks. And pretty soon, if it's not working, you call medical control and say, hey, can I quit? No open label amiodarone or lidocaine. If you break a syringe, they're automatically out of the protocol. Now, if you've given the second dose and you drop the syringe on the ground, it's already been given. That doesn't count as a broken syringe. If they break a syringe during the during the procedure, then you can then you just go to your standard protocol and you start going to open label amiodarone or open label lidocaine, whichever you want to go. Because they're out they're, they're automatically out. If you can't give the study drug in the sequence supposed to then, then they're we enter them in the thing, but then we take them out because of a error of of equipment. You've got to use that silly clear link adapter because then one of the problems with this is that is the the glass syringes and it's and they're incompatible with the lure lock, so you have to use the clear link. Put the clear link on the IV tubing before you attach the syringe. That's the only trick. Picture of the clear link. After enrollment, we've been doing very good at this. The patient gets called in to this number. That number is in your rigs. You don't have to remember it. Um, we have to notify all the patients and all the families that they're enrolled. The family then gets the option to drop out at that point. However, all their data is still good up to that point. Um, just to ensure that the ED knows that the patient has been enrolled in ALPS. This is so that they, that they can dis determine whether they want to use more amiodarone or lidocaine or not. Document what you normally do. If your monitor is used, I need you to document in your chart that it was your monitor or if, you know, if it's, if your AMR and Vancouver Fires monitor was used, be sure to put in the chart that Vancouver Fires monitor was used because you have, that has all the, uh, all the PCO data on the process file. Um, Try to time stamp each dose of, uh, with the syringe number of the ALPS drug, document the shock number that follows each dose and precedes each dose, therefore, and the study drug kit number, barcode. Just a reminder that we're also doing SUDS. This is really something that AMR only needs to worry about. All patients with pre-hospital cardiac arrest, even if they get an ROSC, so it's any sudden, unexpected death. <coughs> we exclude traumatic, violent deaths, overdoses. Draw blood as soon as possible after your IV start. Label the tube, EMS number, data service, uh, copy of the hospital face sheet if you get one. Place everything in a little baggie. This is AMR and put in the ambulance cooler and then they send it off to Sud Central. Uh, and we've had several cases. So AMR is following the SUDS. This is, this is doing a genetic study, looking for genetic markers for, um, for sudden cardiac death. And CAMUS is also in on this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. They get, now, where's my uh, case reviews? Okay. Am I still green? Okay. A couple of cases. Oh, gosh. So this is a perfect thing. 
56-year-old female lying supine on the floor, daughter's doing chest compressions. Family said they heard a crash, found the patient not breathing. <coughs> she was awake, <coughs> normal prior to the event, no cardiac history, no recent illness. Oh, good, this is the tiny version. Um, so, assisted ventilations, chest compressions, um, 12 lead or 4 lead shows V-fib, um, continues with the with uh, CPR at 2 minutes as given defibrillation number 1, went to a normal sinus rhythm. IV access, um, then converted back to defib, was defibbed again, shock number two. And this is the picture. So defib to a probable sinus, deteriorating, then defib to a sinus brady. <coughs> Pulseless still at the carotids, uh, even with that, respiration assisted, uh, blood glucose, uh, IV had been started, blood glucose was 56, so they gave some dextrose, which is un interesting, but uh, probably not, certainly not harmful at that point. Um, once again, after two minutes of CPR, found to be in the fib, shock number three. Crowded pulses, none. Epinephrine was given. Defib number four. Systolic, okay, once again, respiration assisted, patient pulses. This is what we've got on our PCO after that. Patient still pulseless. Amiodarone was given. Patient has capnography, which shows a capnography of a CO2 of 20. Gets some more epinephrine. Gets a manual gets a defibrillation number five. Systolic blood pressure. Capnography shows a CO2 of 6. Patient was in transport at that, by that point. So what's wrong with this picture? No Alps. Uh, the patient, the hospital actually had been, uh, medical control had been called after about the third or fourth shock and a, 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 and consulted and medical control, of course, had no idea. The medical control doesn't necessarily have anything to do with ALPS. They don't understand that. You know, they, they know that we're doing ALPS when we bring them in. They don't run it. They don't have anything to do with it. So the, the, the physician on the line assumed that he was supposed to answer some some cardiac related question according to AHA guidelines he says well why don't you try some amiodarone which of course is what we would have done in the old day before we were doing the study because at that certainly after three or four shocks you're going to give something for an anti dysrhythmic so it was a combination of, uh, of, of people going down the and we've already discussed this with the medics involved sort of going down the, the garden path and not thinking that, hey, this is what we're doing. We're doing ALPS in lieu of dysrhythmic drugs at this point to see if these dysrhythmic drugs actually do any work or not. Uh, the patient did not survive the, uh, as a matter of fact, was never even admitted to the emergency department with basically a DOA. Uh, I can already guarantee you with a as long as they had the CO, that you've got a, a good waveform and a CO2 of six, you've got a pretty well non-perfusing patient at that point. That's a dead patient. Not that 
not that our treatment did anything bad or necessarily good. I mean, it would, you know, not everybody survives CPR and ventricular fibrillation. I'm certainly not suggesting that anything was done that that didn't do ha, didn't Im improve the outcome for the patient. All we know is that we didn't get the rock study out of this one. Okay, on arrival to a care center to find a 46-year-old male lying in bed with staff performing CPR. Patient had been increasingly lethargic and altered one hour prior, noted to be hyperglycemic, was pulses, apneic, compressions and ventilations begun immediately. Patient has a history of insulin-dependent diabetes, paraplegia due to an epidural abscess, COPD, et cetera. So chest compressions, um, assisted ventilation, chest compressions, um, airway adjunct, assisted ventilation, chest compressions. Uh, trying to find his... Um, Uh, initial initial uh, interpretation of his ECG is asystole. Uh, blood glucose was 571. I'm, I, I'm willing to bet his potassium was a little high at that point too, or low, one of the two. Um, asystole again. It got epinephrine, uh, ET tube. Uh, now, comes back as ventricular fibrillation, defib number one. CPR continues. Um, ETCO2, uh, 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 he's intubated. ETCO2 is good. Um, and then he gets... Alps. We don't have recurring V-fib. Matter of fact, looks like he's asystole. Epinephrine, asystole, CO2 is 4. Asystole, 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 asystole. CO2 is three. This one got to be called in the field. But once again, this was the one. So, no recurring VFib. Had a single episode of VFib. Doesn't qualify for Alps at that point. Would have taken another VFib. Patient went immediately from V-fib to a systole. Okay. All right, this is not an ALP study. Patient drinking beer since noon. Of course I'm going to climb a ladder then. <laughs> Admits to six beers, missed the third rung, so third rung. Not that. Landed on the left ankle and rolled it. Denies hitting head. Denies head, neck, or back pain. Da 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 da. 55 year old male, left ladder on the ground, moderate distress. Boot cut off, soccer room, and find open dislocation fracture. Wound wrapped and splinted. He got fentanyl for pain. Vitals monitored, transport, transported code 3 to southwest and given a trauma alert. Did he, did he pass the C-spine clearance algorithm? He's intoxicated and he has a distracting injury. He's 55, so he's right at that cusp between being an old fart and, a, and, and you know, well, we don't bounce as well, so, you know, the, many of your trauma, many of your trauma, many of your trauma experts recommend anyone over 55 
be entered into, you know, that's one of your high suspicions for trauma. Now, did he need to be on a backboard? No. Did he need to be on a C collar? Yes, if you were admitting him to the trauma team, trauma system. Why not, you know, what was the compelling thing about a fracture of the ankle that required code three return, which is dangerous for you and dangerous for the patient, and a trauma alert? This is not a long bone, this is not a femur with a long bone likely problem. This is not a, you know, so if this guy was really okay, okay enough not to think, well, I don't need to worry about his neck, why did he need to be a trauma alert? Didn't. You, could, you don't have to, just because you give somebody pain meds doesn't mean you have to bring them in trauma alert. Now, here's another one. Car versus bicycle in parking lot of high school. School staff is assisting the patient. Patient and bystanders. The patient was riding through his bike across the parking lot when he struck a vehicle and the vehicle struck him. Pain in the right leg, no LOC, head, neck, back pain. Takes no medication, no history of allergies, by the standards say he's been awake the whole time. 15 year old, laying on his side, awake oriented, able to move, feel all extremities. Head to toe exam shows large avulsion displacement below right knee. Bleeding appeared stopped. He also had, when he's rolled over, he had displacement deformed in the right thigh, possible femur fracture. Patient has bruising to the inside of the left knee. No other obvious trauma on quick exam. So possible right femur fracture, avulsion of skin of the right lower leg, possible tibia and fibula injury. IV was started, he got some fentanyl. He's a big guy. It said he was 160 pounds at the beginning of this, but actually he was about he was about 90 kilos, so he was bigger than that. Big 15 year old. Um, splinted, cardboard transported, code 3 as a trauma alert. Didn't have, now did he clear the C-spine algorithm? No. Distracting injuries. Alone. And a, and a crash. Motor vehicle versus bike. Did he need to be backboarded? No. I don't even know that he needed to be in as a trauma alert. I don't mind it because of the evolution. It turned out, just as an aside, that that patient was certainly stable, and 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 if it had been explained, he was ultimately transferred to Randall or to OHSU, one of the two, uh, because of the, of the sort of degloving kind of injury, the avulsion thing, they needed to do some, a little extra work on that. And also because he's, even though he's you know, almost 200 pounds, he's a 15 year old. Uh, he didn't have a femur fracture, he had, he had, a, he had tibia, tib and fib fracture, so he, you know, which is an open wound, and he, so he needed, and he needed some work on the skin because of that avulsion, but uh, he probably could have been diverted to Portland if that had been explained clearly to the to the receiving physician. There was no reason that this this is not a this is not a trauma this is not a trauma team that's that's at the you know that's at death door and we need to do something for stabilization. The patient was already pretty stable. Okay, so any questions about changes in the orders or, or augmentations of the orders, if, if you will? Uh, yeah, I would say the sepsis alert would come in code three. And the IGEL is EMT approved in the same way? IGEL is, uh, yeah, just, just uh, 
the eye gel uh, being a being a simple or not so simple super superglottic airway is the same is if that's an EMT approved thing it's an MPD approved if they've had the training now what I do with the training for that is most of the EMTs that are going to use it are like district 10 district 3 um, uh, people up in north country far into north country and I'll let the agency train them to our standard. We have the training materials and all that. It's a very simple thing to do. And then they are OK to use it prior to you getting there. Any good life-saving things will be good. Just like if you want to use uh, intranasal uh, Narcan uh, for your EMTs, talk to me. Well, after you go through the tra after they go through the training, since about uh, two weeks ago. Sweet. Yeah. So we can, you know, so if you. So if. If